Blast off. Welcome to the magic. <laughs> Yahoo. All right, All right. So we are recording this Friday night. Friday night. Uh, the day before 9-11. And this will come out on Sunday, which is going to be the day after, after 9-11. So we thought it was a good opportunity to at least take a second and acknowledge, you know, that date. Uh, for 20 years. For 20 years. It's, uh, I can't even wrap my head around that, first of all. Yeah. Um, if 9-11 had, hadn't happened, there's very slim chance that two of us would be sitting here together. Sure. Uh, <laughs> About none. It's <laughs> probably zero, <laughs> unless, you know, a lot of weird things had happened. But, uh, you know, because Jerry and I met working together after 9-11, and then, you know, I've grown to be friends and business partners and all those things. And uh, so it, it definitely had an impact on our life um, in, in more ways than one. And we want to take an opportunity, right. though, to to really kind of just acknowledge, you know, all, all the people that died that day. Um, I know that anybody listening to this podcast uh, is either a public servant yep. or military service member or married to one or something. So anybody that's watching this show has some kind of connection, whether you even came in after 9-11, doesn't matter. All of that has driven probably most of us, most of our lives yep, for, the for the last 20 years. For the last sure. 20 years. Yep. You know, Jerry and I both have lost uh, friends that were in the military service. I was on active duty in the Army uh, when 9-11 uh, happened, and it, you know, changed my life not only that day, but just years to come. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it has a lot to do with why I can't walk around standing upright. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of things happen. So um, yep. you have anything you want to throw in there? Or? No, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh as you're as you're saying that, I'm thinking about all the things that that were different. Uh, I was a deputy marshal in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and uh, I was on this tactical team. and And a, a FEMA flight came around and picked us up uh, on the 13th and flew us into New York. And we dug on the pile for a week, and then went down to uh, D.C. and did like a security detail for a couple of weeks on our headquarters building down there. Um, but there was, a, I mean, even when I was in New York, there were a lot of people reevaluating what they were doing with their life. You yeah. know, there were guys that were at, adamantly going to change agencies um, because they had had it. That you know, it had been in the back of their minds anyway. But they're like, "Nope, this is it. I've had it. I'm going. I'm going to do, you know, X instead of Y or whatever." Yeah. And uh, that's what I did. And a lot of a lot of people did the same thing. Oh, you, if um, you'd have told me I was going to be a federal law enforcement officer after 9/11, I would have just like laughed in your face. I was an active duty soldier, yeah. and was doing way different things. Yeah. And life takes a turn. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, in, in good ways and bad ways, a lot of people's lives were changed. Uh, we just yep. want to take a, you know, want to take a minute to kind of recognize that. Yep. And uh, we appreciate all you guys uh, that are watching this because in some way you, you're you serving, you know, yep. public serving. Serving the greater good. Absolutely. For sure. So thanks for that. All right. All right. Now let's get on to talking about yeah. TSP. So what it's, we got? it's been a crazy week. And uh, I know you, crazy. you've got, we both, we have a, both have a big test on Monday. Um, and, and it's been a, a rough week anyway, and the last 30 minutes of the market just threw me for a complete loop uh, here on, on Friday afternoon. Jerry came in looking not- <laughs> for a bottle of vodka. He was like, whoa, what the Woo! hell just happened? Seriously, the last 30 <laughs> minutes was a, was rough, um, but it capped off a rough week anyway. Well, so let's talk about let's it. Let's do it. Okay. It was a rough end to a rough week. Uh, C fund was down <clears throat> 1.69% for the week. S fund down 2.58. I fund down 1.11. And the F fund was pretty much flat, up 0.02. All right. So we had a request to talk about uh, leading and lagging indicators. So we're going to talk about that first. Um, I got a pretty good handful of slides about it. I'm, I'm going to... Uh, give you guys the, the link and where I got the information. I'm going to kind of talk through the highlights of it. I'm not going to read the slides to you. Then uh, bonus chart, we're going to go back and take another look at Bitcoin. Uh, dollar sign BTC USD is actually Bitcoin versus the dollar. So when you look at Bitcoin, it's, uh, it's how it compares to the US dollar. And then uh, intraday charts are kind of interesting. We're going to look at the C and the S fund intraday and what their Fibonacci retracements look like. And then the 18 month weekly charts. Okay. So leading fundamental indicators. <clears throat> so we're going to look at leading and lagging fundamental and technical. Cause we always talk about how, uh, at grow my TSP, we basically use 
technical analysis, uh, not fundamental analysis. So in both forms of analysis, there are leading and lagging indicators. So in terms of fundamental uh, leading indicators, we got, so leading indicator is a piece of economic data that corresponds with the future movement or change in some phenomenon of interest. Um, the idea is that economic leading indicators can help predict and forecast future events and trends in business, markets, and the economy. I don't know if I agree with all three of those, but um, on a micro level, they certainly work. On, on a macro level, in terms of uh, big indexes like the S&P 500, the, the leading economic indicators are awful tough to use to, uh, to predict direction of price. But um, So obviously different indicators uh, are used for accuracy, precision, um, and they're kind of specific to the whether business market or economy that they're talking about. Um, but some of the uh, some of the leading indicators, um, index for cons consumer confidence, purchasing managers index, initial jobless claims, and hourly average hours worked are examples of leading indicators. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago we talked about consumer confidence index. And this was the chart that we put up a couple of weeks ago because this one is pretty telling and it went kind of viral pretty quick. Didn't seem to have too much of, a, of an impact right away. Uh, this week maybe is when it finally kind of hit, but we had a huge move down um, in terms of consumer sentiment in August. And it, it, it kind of pushed a lot of people back on their heels about, about some things, but... Um, it came out, uh, it was the last week of August that it came out. I guess it went through the end of August, but um, it, was a, it was a big number for, for a, a decline in consumer sentiment. So is, was that a leading indicator? Um, we'll see as, as the market goes forward. Again, I'm a little frazzled because we've had five consecutive days, down days on the S&P 500. Okay. Lagging fundamentals. Um, a lagging indicator is an observable or measurable factor that changes sometime after the economic, financial, or business variable with which it's correlated. So um, examples like the unemployment rate. So we find out after the fact, right? The number comes out after the fact when people have already been unemployed. So the, the impact is, is already felt. People have already been unemployed and then we find out that they've been unemployed. So it's a lagging indicator. Uh, corporate profits, again, is, it's another big one. Um, and, and earnings could be also considered a, a lagging indicator because we, we find out after the fact uh, when, when earnings get reported. Uh, so lagging indicators differ from leading, uh, such as retail sales, the stock market, which are used to forecast and make predictions. So a lagging indicator. We had a bunch of people talking about uh, what did we think about the number that came out, I guess, last Friday uh, in terms of unemployment. Unemployment, the unemployment rate has been decreasing. This is a 10-year chart. So for most of the last 10 years, from 2012 to 2020, uh, more people have been employed. The unemployment rate has decreased. And then obviously COVID, we had a huge spike up. And then the recovery from COVID, people are going back to work. And so the question is, uh, the question about from, from last week really is, does this continue down? And does that mean that as the federal stimulus money, um, unemployment money uh, stops, which it did, will people start going back to work and then the unemployment rate continues down? Um, it's, a, it's a big question. There's a lot, a lot out there around that. But in terms of a 10-year chart, this is what it looks like. And the trend certainly is still headed back down, which is good for the economy. Technical indicators. So actually, let me go back to this. No, I don't need to go back. So the, all these, the first couple slides here, uh, leading fundamental indicators and lagging fundamental indicators, I both took directly off of Investopedia. So if you go, if you Google leading fundamental indicators or lagging fundamental indicators, 
All this will come up on Investopedia. The leading technical indicators and lagging technical indicators, I took off uh, stockcharts.com school. So it's, it's actually school.stockcharts.com. Okay, so as the name implies, leading indicators are designed to lead price movement. And for our purposes, most of the, the good leading indicators in terms of technical analysis are, are talking about m momentum. Um, so momentum is basically the number of periods used to, to calculate the indicator. So <clears throat> an example is that the stochastic oscillator, um, as, you, as you adjust the number, the, the periods, the, the days, um, you get your oscillating lines go higher or lower. And how you set those, um, they become more or less sensitive. And we're going to kind of get into a little bit of that later. But some of the popular uh, leading, technical leading indicators, we use relative strength a lot, stochastic os oscillator a lot, Williams percent R sometimes. I don't, I don't do that too much because it's not as useful in terms of TSP. But the momentum indicators are what we use as leading indicators for technical analysis. <clears throat> so some of the benefits and drawbacks, uh, there are many benefits using leading indicators. Uh, most significantly, they allow for early signaling for entry and exit. So uh, the idea is that leading indicators generate uh, more signals and allow opportunities to trade. So early signals can act uh, uh, forewarn us um, in terms of potential strength or potential weakness. Uh, so here's, here's kind of an important one. Because they generate more signals, leading indicators are best used in trading markets. Um, these indicators can be used in trending markets, but usually with the major trend, not against it. So we're going to do a chart that kind of shows that in a minute, but uh, I just want to kind of point that out. So with early signals come the prospect of higher returns. Uh, with the higher returns come the reality of greater risk. Uh, I'm going to get to see, we're going to see why that is. More signals and earlier signals mean that the chance of a false signal, also known as a whipsaw, that increases. So we've seen that a lot this year. False signals will increase the potential for losses. Whipsaws can generate Commissions that can often eat away at profits. We don't really have that problem with commissions uh, within TSP. Lagging technical indicators follow the price action and are commonly uh, referred to as trend-following indicators. So rarely, if ever, will these indicators lead price of a security. Um, so if you if used in trading markets, uh, trend-following indicators will likely lead to many false signals and whipsaws. Some popular trend following indicators include moving averages and MACD, which we use quite a bit. But we, have, we just have to acknowledge that they are uh, lagging indicators as opposed to stochastic, which is a leading indicator. And we're going to show, again, we're going to show that all, all of this on one chart. So benefits and drawbacks of lagging indicators. One of the main benefits of trend following indicators is the ability to catch a move and remain uh, in a move. So, for example, the 10-day moving average, we use that quite a bit as, a, as an initial guideline, right? And then if it breaks through the 10-day, it goes to the 50-day. Um, so those that's kind of an example of uh, how you would use the moving averages. Moving averages are definitely lagging because they're taking a price over the prior number of days, whether it's 10-day or 20-day, you know, 50-day moving, uh, moving average. They're, they're, by definition, a lagging indicator. Um, so another big drawback for us, trend following indicators is a signal, uh, uh, signals w the trend may be late. So it, it's, it's not leading in terms of trying to find the top of the market or the bottom. It's, it's going to be late. It's going to be late by definition. So by the time the moving average crossover occurs, right, when the 50-day when the crosses the 200-day, for example, they call it the, uh, the death cross, um, by then, a significant portion of the loss has already been has already occurred. So, and it's the same thing on getting back in. Late entry and exit points can skew the risk reward ratio. Most of this is written for the concept of 
more or less day trading. It's, it's not, uh, it's very tough to use these indicators when you only have two moves a month in TSP. Um, you have to have your trade in by noon to get this, that day's closing price. But these are the only tools that we have available. And they do still apply. So kind of wrapping this part of it up, challenges of indicators. Uh, for technical indicators, there's a trade-off between sensitivity and consistency. So this is kind of what I was talking about before. In an ideal world, we want an indicator that's sensitive to price movement, gives early signals, and has few false signals. If we increase the sensitivity of an indicator, we provide earlier signals, but the number of false signals will increase. So that's why we've, we've talked about before, if, if anybody has a better way of, you know, I use the 10-day, 50-day, and, and 200-day moving average lines. If I, you can tell on the 10-day, if, if we trade only on the 10-day moving average, we would be getting in and out of the market a lot more. And we don't have enough moves because of the TSP rules to really trade the 10-day moving average line. Uh, the 50-day moving average line is a, is a better tool for us based on the requirements that we have. Um, so if we decrease the sensitivity by increasing the number of periods, right, if we go from the 50-day to the 200-day, for example, then the number of false signals will decrease, but the signals will lag, and this will skew the risk-reward ratio, meaning if you have to wait for price to come down to the 50-day before you make a decision, you've already locked in the, you know, that amount of loss. If it continues down, you, you only locked in that loss, and, and the, the, you would have taken more losses. Uh, so it, it's... It, uh, lagging indicators uh, are useful, but there are challenges. So the longer a moving average is, the slower it will react and fewer signals will be generated. So if, like the 200-day, for example, we haven't seen the S&P 500 down at the 200-day moving average, uh, I don't think at all this year. So same holds true for various momentum indicators. Okay. So... Bottom line is it's up to each investor to select a time frame that suits his or her trading style and objectives. All right, so how do we wrap all this stuff together? Here's a four-year weekly chart of the C fund, okay? So in terms of leading indicators, because we talked about slow stochastic um, and relative strength being leading indicators. Once we're in the green up here, we're overbought. So... What we're looking for is a breakdown. We're, we're overbought, 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 and then we start to get a breakdown. That, that's leading. I mean, in this case, it happened pretty much on the same week, but it's, it's a leading indicator. Once we're overbought, we're just waiting. Uh, as price continues to go higher, we're, we're waiting for a breakdown um, as, a, as a signal to get out. MACD, you can see, lags a little bit. The top of the MACD line... It's a little bit forward of the top of the um, RSI line. So MACD is lagging a little bit. Slow stochastic actually went way positive back here. So it's, it's leading. Back here, same, same time that RSI went overbought. So it's leading in terms of all this time. We're just, we know we're sort of on borrowed time. But as long as price keeps going up, we're, we're staying on it, right? So the... The moving average lines are really helpful for a, a majority of the time. We pretty much rode the 10-day for the last year. Where they don't work is what they, they called in the, in the definitions that we were reading, the, the trading markets. So, for example, this chunk right here, just zoom in, it went up and down along that 10-day moving average line. Uh, for that period of six months or so. Um, and you would have gotten in and out, in and out quite a bit if, if we had uh, traded based on the 10-day moving average line. If we had traded based on the 50-day, you probably wouldn't have gotten out at all. Probably would have stayed in the whole time. But you would have seen those losses and gains in your account over time. So that's basically how, how it, it works. It's not... Um, it's not an exact science. It's an art. You you follow the the lowest number, the tightest trend line or moving average line that you can 
that you can do within the structure that you have. So if you're a day trader, you might be trading, you know, on a five minute chart, you're looking at really, really tight moving average lines. Um, for us, I'm constantly going back and forth between moving average lines uh, in anticipation. If I'm going to do a, a reallocation, how many more do I have that month? Um, so it gets tricky. And where we are now, we have been more or less overbought for the whole year. We get RSI above that 80 line, MACD flat, really high, slow stochastic, flat, really high, um, and price keeps moving up, and it's moving up along the 10-day moving average line. So once they start to break down, and theoretically RSI will lead down, then MACD will follow, slow stochastic should also lead. Okay. So hopefully that gives you guys a, a little bit better idea of leading and lagging fundamental and technical indicators. Okay, bonus chart, Bitcoin. We haven't gone this far back in Bitcoin in a little bit, so I just wanted to kind of review where we are in the big scheme of things. So the Elliott wave count for Bitcoin, we have a huge one leg up to here at the end of 2017. Then for all of 2018, we had a, a two leg. Now we're in the three, okay? And within the three is gonna be five waves. One, two, three, four, five. And that's gonna be a three. Then we should get some kind of four and then a five. So in the big scheme of things, that's how Bitcoin should look. So, how, so again, this isn't, it's not TSP, it's Bitcoin, but the Elliott wave chart is really good and and all the cryptos not just bitcoin all the cryptos uh, trade on on technicals really really well so where are we right now again in the big scheme of things we're assuming that we put in a four uh back there in july i'm saying assuming because one possibility is bitcoin does an a, B, C, or some something, and, and finishes down here, then that would be the four. And then we'd have the five. So we won't know for sure uh, until we get back above this high. So there's only really two possibilities. Um, either Bitcoin comes down, gets below this four, and then this becomes the four. Or the four is already in place, and we get, hopefully, a one, two, three... Uh, and then one, two, three, four, five to the three. So if we zoom that in, we're going to zoom in and basically look at like this part of the chart right here to figure out kind of what to do next. So here we are relatively currently in Bitcoin. This was the big four from right here. Okay, if this is the four, and we had this first move higher, so if we, I, I didn't do the, I could have done the Fibonacci retracement from this top to this four to figure out where it topped out at. And I didn't do the chart for that, but I can tell you it topped out right above the 62% retracement level. So. From here up to here is 62% of this whole move right here. So it's a little bit above it, but it's a pretty good Fibonacci um, indicator. So this would have been the 62% retracement from the high up here. Okay. So if this is the top that we're going to get for the time being in Bitcoin... Then the next question is how f how far down does it come? If on the first scenario I said if this if this, this four holds if this four doesn't hold, then price comes down somewhere down here and this becomes the four. For right now, let's say that this four is in place. This would be a one. Ideally, we would get like an A B C. Somewhere between the 50, if it hits the 50 or the 61.8 retracement level, that would be ideal. Then this would be one, 
two, and then we keep going. That's what we're hoping for. That's what I'm hoping for. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really, I want to get back into Bitcoin. Um, it's actually, I'm not doing Bitcoin. I'm doing Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, but it pretty closely tracks Bitcoin. Um, yeah. And again, remember everybody, the only reason we bring these bonus charts in is just to give you some kind of perspective outside of the TSP, because this is all supposed to be educational. Yeah. And sometimes we just kind of, you know, there's not enough going on in the CSNI to kind of learn certain things, right? And you're looking at the same chart all the time. Right. So these bonus charts, um, hopefully you guys find these useful because I do, regardless of whether you want to invest in Bitcoin has nothing to do with it. Right. Right. Bitcoin just happens to be pretty volatile. So you get to see some of these things that Jerry talks about, right? You get to see some of these technical indicators that when you're doing, I would say normal stocks, you know, single stocks, you see a lot more of. We don't see that in indexes as much. Indexes aren't volatile for the whole the point that we're in, in right, indexes, right? right? So yeah. and just take it as a learning tool if you're like, why the hell are we talking about Bitcoin? We're in yeah, TSP. no, it's, it's just, I mean, for, for today, for Bitcoin, it's Elliott Wave and Fibonacci retracements. You know, yeah. it's, it's just an example of how you, how you apply those tools. Yeah, and what I like is, you know, it, it, there's a whole lot of people in, into cryptocurrency right now, and you can trade it using these same educational tools we're, give, we're giving yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to be on it. You have to yeah. be watching it. You you know, you can't be uh, passive at any point. Yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> you, you know. can. You, the problem with, with Bitcoin, I mean, I, I don't have the, uh, the logarithmic chart up here, but um, if, <coughs> go, go back to the chart one. If this is the four. I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> if this is the four, then the, the next big move is a five. And the five, we talked about it before. I mean, it's going to, it should be at a minimum up here, like, you know, 120, 150,000 on, on Bitcoin. I mean, I've seen, uh, I, I follow some guys that have the thing up close to 200,000 at the, at the top. And they, and you can certainly justify in terms of Elliott wave, how you would get there. Yeah. Um, so doesn't mean it's going to happen. It just means there's a lot higher probability based on what we know. Right, and right. We, Best and what we, we won't know, know until it happens. So yeah. you're not going to, you're not going to, unless you're in it, unless you're buy and hold, which in, in this case depends on, for me, if I'm in my brokerage account, you know, I'm buy and hold. I'm not in and out, in and out, in and out, because right. the right. fees and everything is going to kill me. Right, right. If I'm in my IRA and I want to buy grayscale Bitcoin, which is, you know, uh, where we have our IRA, they, they yeah, allow they you to it. trade that. Yeah. So that's an ETF that we can buy. And so that allows us to get into Bitcoin without really getting into Bitcoin. Right. Right. So we're not, we're, it's, and it's not as volatile. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say. Like in terms of volatility, I mean, the, the top here a couple of days ago was just over 52,000. Right. And now we're down to 45,000, which is a pretty big chunk of a, of a loss. It's just that, on, on a percentage basis, it's down, you know, almost to the 38% retracement level. Um, but in real dollar terms, it's a lot of money. So it's, it's very hard. That's why they say, don't look at your account. <laughs> you, 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 if you're, if you're buying and holding Bitcoin, um, just leave it, just, alone. just leave it, you know, it's, it's, you, it's not this just, if you're buying hold, yeah, you're just going to leave it anyway. But if, if you're, um, check in once a week. Yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely check in, want to check in. Check in once a week, but don't stress. But we're not buy and hold. We're we're actively, you know, uh, investing, so we don't do that. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to throw up two intraday charts just because they're kind of interesting. And again, they uh, are. We are back to the to the TSP funds. We're going to look at um, the CSNI on a two month, thirty minute basis. So, as you can see. So again, each one of these ticks is 30 minutes. This is what I was talking about. The last 30 minutes of the market was right there, that red line. Uh, so in the last hour, it dropped below the 38% retracement level all the way down to the 50% retracement level. Uh, so hopefully we get support at the 50%. The other interesting thing out of this is right here, we had just hit that oversold level. So if we hit the oversold level, like, like this, for example, we hit the oversold level here, we hit this oversold level, and the market stopped moving down and it went back up. Same thing here. Hit this oversold level, 
Marcus started moving back up. Same thing here, right? Okay. So it doesn't always have to be that way. We hit, let's see. We hit this oversold level right here, and the market did start moving back up for a second, but then rolled right over and went much lower than the prior low and still only a little bit below on the relative strength. So we can stay down here on relative strength for quite a while. It can stay down here and price can continue to fall. Just like when price is going up, you can be overbought and stay overbought for a long time and price can keep going higher. So the indicators are good, but they're not 100%. S-Fund. I was really hoping to see support at 2250. Um, we had resistance here, broke through it, tested 2250 here, and kept going higher. Um, I was okay during the week as we started to come back down. We bounced off that 2250 level, started to come higher, came down, hit it again, and then today at the end of the day rolled over and broke broke down. So not a good not a good sign. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about that. Not a great sign. On the the only well, the only positive here. I just felt like a Forrest Gump. <laughs> that's all I have to say about, <laughs> say about that. that. <laughs> I mean, I could just babble about it, but I don't think it's doing anybody any good. We were extremely oversold here at the thirty-eight percent retracement level. We are less oversold here at the fifty percent which means there's less powerful selling. The, the, the momentum isn't as strong on this down leg as it was on this one, which could be a, a good sign. Could be uh, we're not going to collapse. If we, if we had had a huge, you know, if this kept going and we finished the day down here, um, it would have been a much worse, a much worse signal. So we'll see what happens on Monday. I fund I fund looks like it's correcting. Doesn't look like it's collapsing. I mean, we we had a pretty good run. Um and then we have a 1 2 do we get a 3 down to the 38 or even down to the 50% to fill this gap? Um I don't know, but I actually think that the I fund has a little bit further to go down. But again, I really don't think it's collapsing. But it was the last 30 minutes of the day and I haven't had time to really really um, kind of digest these charts yet. Okay. 18-month weekly charts of the C fund. So, like we've been saying all along, <clears throat> as long as, on a weekly basis, price stays above the 10-week moving average line, we're good to go. And we close today, for the week, pretty much right on the 10-week moving average line. We did that plenty of times over the... the all year long, right? Three weeks ago, we hit it and reversed higher during the week, but we hit it during that week. Can you kind of zoom in there just so we can see all those little points? Because yep. I, I think it's, I think it's good. I mean, I, yep. I, I think it's good visually to see that. Yeah, drops down below, it comes back up. Yep. You know, so because I hear people, I, I've seen people, you know, make comments, talk about, hey, you know, it dipped below today, it dipped below. You know, are we out? Are we? You know, and it's like, well, we got you have to let it play out. Yeah. If if it goes below and stays below that's when we get concerned right right, right. not not dips below and kind of bounces because we that's can't just trade the, that yeah absolutely. i mean if we were if it was day trading yeah um absolutely you you this if we were talking about day trading we'd be looking at completely different charts uh i look at those charts too but <laughs> we can't there's no point talking about it on the show yeah because you know? they're not relevant no okay s fund basically the same thing except the s fund uh, is a little bit disappointing. Let's call it that. Um, we've got this long-term horizontal consolidation pattern. Right, For Most of 2021, we've gone sideways. Uh, we've got higher lows over the last three, well, three weeks, basically. We have this little this trend right there. We 
were talking about a potential breakout two weeks ago right there. And then last week was a pretty good consolidation. Zoom in there a little bit. Last week was a pretty good consolidation uh, after that breakout week. But this week took out all of last week's gains and half of the prior week's gains. And we're back to support, ideally, at the 10-week moving average on the S fund. So it's not a, it's, it hasn't broken down yet. It just, hopefully, is just correcting uh, out of two pretty solid weeks that we've had the last two weeks. But again, until, this, until we really break out of this pattern one way or the other, we just don't know. Okay. I fund, kind of similar to the S fund in that we've had this sideways consolidation for the last few months. We had a nice breakout last week on the I fund, and then this week we gave back a big chunk of those gains. Um, I'm not on a weekly basis. I'm still not too worried about it. Um, this consolidation is pretty good. And it's possible that we come back into the consolidation and it continues before we go higher. Uh, it's also possible we go down from here, but I, I just um, I just don't buy it yet. I mean, I'm still optimistic that we're moving higher from here. F fund. I was really worried about the F fund in the beginning of the week. Uh, you can't see it on this chart because it's weekly, but um, the F fund had definitely broken down, but in the last two days recovered all the gains from, or all the, all the losses from the beginning of the week. So we got a relatively low volume, pretty significantly low volume, really, um, positive week for the F fund. But again, if you're, if the stock fund uptrend is still intact, the F fund is not the place that you want to be. So, all right. Questions. Questions. I, I, I got to apologize because I am a little bit rattled from all the all the the stuff that we got going on. The and market got sh got him all shook. It did got me all <laughs> shook. I, I mean, I had I had my plan, and um, the market didn't care about your plan. It, it didn't care the last thirty minutes. Yeah, and and then I didn't I didn't you know we uh, uh, we have a lot of stuff going on this weekend, so I we, we were recording the show early, and uh, it kind of threw me for a little loop. Yeah, well, it gives us a lot to talk about next week. Yes, it does. Um, so if you enjoyed what you hear, <laughs> make sure to share it with your friends. Uh, we do our best each week to just kind of, you know, take a look at the last week, th start thinking about what that next week looks like. Uh, this whole lines in the sand thing. I saw, I saw a lot of comments from our live stream that we did last week. Yep. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get, uh, the next one set up next week, probably Wednesday or Thursday or something like that. Um, but the the idea of it, right? The theory of it is sinking into it to some folks mm -hmm. uh, about the whole lines in the sand, and so you you could literally watch this show each week and figure out your lines in the sand. Yep. You Definitely. could, if that's all you wanted to do, is say, "Hey, I just want to kind of think. Okay, I know I'm going to get out, and I know I'm going to get back in, and that's really all you need to do." Right now, you you can you can get better and better at that, right? Yep. And fine tune that, but at the end of the day. Um, to keep yourself from really worrying too much about the market, you could literally each weekend take a look at some stuff like that we're doing, yeah. right? Simple yeah. things. Really, the last half of this show yeah. yep. is all you need to kind of draw those lines in the sand yeah. and say to yourself, okay, I feel comfortable, you know, getting out here, getting in here, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So hopefully you guys are getting some value out of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we, we have shown that C-Fund weekly chart now that's gone along – 10 week moving average line, which is like the 50 day moving average line. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's been going up along that line for almost a year. So in, unless and until it, it breaks below that line, there's nothing to really worry about. And then we'll have some kind of uh, retracement from that breakdown. And if, if that gets above the prior high, we're, we're good. If it, if it doesn't get above the prior high, then the trend has changed. Then you know, if, if you're kind of long-term doing this, that's when you want to go. All right, man. Uh, that's all we got for this week. So all you right. guys just uh, throw some comments, some questions there. We'll be happy to answer. Sounds good. Have a Thanks good week. A lot. All right. See you guys.